Before we start this presentation, and those of you who might have been a few months ago to California State Farm, or you might have seen a version of this, so you can leave now, or you can stay. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to show of hand as how many of you have been to either drills or real, uh, real incidents. And great. So it looks like all of you, and all of you might have been in operation, in situation, in planning, and so on. And you may think that crisis communication is the job of a professional communication person that's going to come there and talk to the press. And unfortunately, that's the mistake that a lot of people make. And I'm here to tell you that all of you are a part of crisis communication. Because if I go to the site and I talk to the press and talk to the TV and convince them that you are doing a great job, if you're not doing your job in the field, if people don't see any action, basically what we have communicated to those people, uh, entirely something different than what I have told the press. So all of you that have a responsibility to pick up the oil or logistics to provide uh, supplies, whatever it is, you are a part of that crisis communication. And I want, to, I want you all to keep that in mind. Now, in the next 20 minutes or so, um, we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you some videos, and we're going to talk about what are the expectations of the stakeholders, and then if there's time at the end, I'll give you some do's and don'ts of how to talk to the media. So, uh, let's go right. I'm not going, I'm not going to, um, Show all of these videos, I'll just show the last one and then we go from there. So I think you saw enough of that, so <laughs> let's I'm not an uh, IBM person. I use Apple, so that's I forgot about it. Once I got away, once I got away from corporate world, I, um, but let me, before I go to that slide, so sorry about the technical problem, but um, just imagine yourself being, sitting at your home, and that was in your backyard. So you have to ask yourself, what would you expect from somebody that's responsible for that? And uh, since we are at prevention first, a lot of you have assets that are actually on the ground, except if you are having a tanker or something. So it is, it is really important that your crisis communication starts way before you have an incident. And that is basically getting to know your neighborhood where you offer. And you do that by being involved in the community. <coughs> and uh, someone once said, you cannot plow and harvest a field in one season. You can't have an accident and parachute people in trying to fix the problem now because people don't know you. But if you have been in that community and working with the community, you have built some trust at least when you show up with an incident, people um, uh, know who you are and maybe they have some trust in what you are telling them and what you are doing. So one of the first things that happens when you, if there's crisis, somebody is trying always to come up with some clever name. Don't try to do that. Your crisis is not an event. Event is a musical music festival or something like that. If you have a spill, 
you have a spell. So calling that incident or spell is not an event. If you have an explosion, you have an explosion. That's what it is. Don't try to be clever right from the start because people read right through what you're trying to do. And so you have to ask yourself, what do stakeholders want from me or from the RP? Um, if, if that was in your backyard, you want somebody to show up and take responsibility for what has occurred. Now, I'm sitting next to a lawyer here, and of course, public affairs people and lawyers, they always get to, to, to it about this issue. Because he is trying to tell you, don't even go there saying, I'm sorry. Because the minute you say that, they're going to say, oh, it's your fault. Now, I'm here to tell you, actually, go out there and say, I'm sorry. You mean it's not your fault. By saying, in my opinion, saying, you are sorry this accident happened. That doesn't mean you did it or you caused it. At least you are telling people, look, I care. Um, you've got to remember, he's trying to spend your money. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to save your reputation. <laughs> so you have to decide, you know, whether you take responsibility or not. I knew I should have gone first. <laughs> Do, yes. do, get the last do everything you can to remedy this quickly. That's what they want to see. They want to see somebody taking responsibility, and they want to see action. That's why I said all of you are a part of that crisis communication, because they want to see people doing the stuff that they're trying to remedy the situation. That's what your stakeholders want to see, and act in a way that shows they care. That's what showing up the very first day saying, I'm sorry, that's important. So we communicate in a lot of different ways. Um, the stakeholders, they look to see how quickly you respond, how well you respond, the amount of resources you br bring into the response and the timing, and how well you communicate <coughs> with the stakeholders. Those are the three key components of uh, crisis communications. Now, I am here to tell you that we all <coughs> talk about showing with more equipment that you need. My advice to you is show with as many communication people as you need. And we, we talk about that in a minute. So who are your stakeholders? And who you should be communicating with? you actually should be communicating with all of your stakeholders, and uh, they are the media, the community, the elected officials and the agencies, and the NGOs. They, these are just some of the, your key stakeholders. They may be others. They are business people that you are impacting. They may be a whole bunch more, but these are some of the key that I have identified. So the media wants to know what happened. They want the story. They want to know what is happening now and what is going to happen next. So it's very important that you keep these three things in mind and always communicate with them in a way that they get what they want. Now, the community needs to know if they are safe. That is the number one issue for the community, if they are safe. The second thing, who covers their damages and how do they file a claim? And the third one, when do, they, when do things get back to normal? That's what they want to know. And when can they go back to impacted areas, open their businesses, go to the beach, whatever it has been impacted that has changed their, <coughs> their routine of their lives. They want to get back to that. The, sec the, the elected people need to know what should they tell their constituents? Who is responsible? How can they avoid a repeat of what has happened? And who is going to cover the damages of their constituents? And finally, the NGOs want to know what is being done to protect the natural resources, what and which natural resources are, or wildlife has been impacted, how long is it going to take to mitigate the environmental impact? Those are some of the key 
issues that your constituents or your stakeholders, they're looking for. And they're looking for that probably every day. So you got to find a way to communicate all of that, what I just outlined for you, and maybe there are others, with those stakeholders that are interested to know. And there are different medias of communication. So you got to first figure out how much you're going to communicate with folks, how often, and what channels of communications you're going to use. There are different channels of communications. So depends. If you're asking that question, then it depends on the duration of response and the sensitivity of the community and the environment. So the plane was, I'm going to use that. It was in a very sensitive area. The growth incident was in a ditch in front, in right in the middle of some very expensive home, very sophisticated people that were there. Now, if you have a, if you have a pipeline on a stretch of five between Tracy and Bakersfield, probably nobody cares. There's nobody to communicate with. So you have to decide how much you're going to communicate and what's the duration of that communication. So the way you do it, press releases, fact sheets, updates, community outreach, door to door, town halls, neighborhood meetings. But I'm going to tell you something. Before you do any town hall, and we just did that for actually for um, dollars. Try to understand what your stakeholders' interests are. Because when you go to a town hall and you can address their concerns or you can address what they are looking for, you have basically have already done your job before the meeting has started. We did a community outreach just recently for Dogger in, in downtown LA. And um, one of the directors of Dogger came to the room and I told him, I said, look, this is, if you talk about this, you have, you have addressed their issues. And that's exactly what took place. The second community meeting, he was going to have it in the same place. I said, if you do it over there, five people are going to show up because you have already addressed their concerns. Now, if you do it right in the middle of the street in the community, 10 people are going to show up. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we did it in the community, only 10 people showed up rather than 100 people because their issues were already addressed. So try to get some intelligence on what people need, what do they want. And we do that by assessment. In Grove, the very first day, people, we, uh, people went and knocked at the doors and talked to some people. Do you get the sense of what the community is all about? Especially if you don't know your community. So the way you communicate, you use websites. Use Twitter, use Facebook, and maybe all of the above. It all depends on your response. But try to communicate as much as your stakeholders need to communicate with them and as often as they want. So now let's talk a little bit about how to handle the media. Um, a lot of us, when show up to this bill, and if you work for a large corporation, you've got somebody like me who comes and talks to the media and so on. So uh, there is no issues. Now, <laughs> if you don't work for a large corporation that has professionals, or when you show up to a site before the uh, media, uh, before, before your media people come, you have a responsibility as the first responder. And your first responder's priority during an incident is to assess the safety of the environment and the people. So if you just mention that to a media person, how, it doesn't matter how aggressive they are. If you tell them, look, I, that's my job. I'm here to do this. And I have communication people that are going to come and talk to you, or here's their number, call them. Usually they accept it. But if they don't, and you go do that, what you need to do, you come back, there are things that you got to keep in mind when you talk to the media. So if you're not a media professional, I want to suggest um, some, uh, some basically do's and don'ts. So the very first rule, whatever you do, use common sense. 
Don't get pressured to give instant interviews. Ask for some time. Go and prepare yourself. Think about what you want to say. And what you want to say is to have a message. And the message, whatever you say, bring it back to that message that you want to repeat. Take time to answer every question. Um, count to five and use the time to think before answering. So if I ask you a question, let me finish my sentence. If you, even if you think you know the answer and you know what I'm asking you. And then counting to five, it seems when you're in the front of press or TV, seems like a long time, but it's nothing. So give yourself some time, think about your answer, and then answer the question. Always tell the truth. Now, I don't know what Joe will tell you. But I'll tell you. I'm not good at my presentation. <laughs> and be confident. If, if you come across as wobbly, how can they have confidence that you are actually going to remedy what has happened? So you want to come across as very confident. Deliver a message what I just said. Have a message and keep repeating that message. Give credit to others. That's very important because you're not there by yourself responding. There are a lot of agencies that are helping you, the fire department, the police department, who may be controlling the traffic. Make sure you, get, you give credit to those people because um, agencies, especially if it's a state land, make sure you give them a lot of <laughs> uh, But agencies are very busy. They're helping you to achieve what you want to achieve. And they are a partner in this movie. The speaking simple, non-technical sentences. I, um, I just talked about a project that we're doing. Uh, we've done several projects for different people. And some of them, we write the updates to the community. Sometimes they decide to write the updates. And it's amazing, you can tell, and I'm an engineer, by the way, but you can tell an engineer wrote the update with all due respect, because it's all technical. And I'm thinking, people are not interested in this. They want to they know when the hell you're going to get out of their neighborhood. They don't care that you put a, an insulation and the wire went in the insulation and the heater. They really don't care about that. They want to know this crow that and we have taken care of it and we are going to do the following so it would never happen again. That's what they're interested in. So make sure your updates are if they're written in simple sentences. Be brief, succinct, and specific, and specific, very specific and accurate. And apologize for the incident and express your sadness. Stick to the facts. Don't ever speculate. And Joe also even would tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> even Joe. Yeah, even Joe. <laughs> don't make up, don't, do not make up answers. If you don't know the answer, and everybody respects that. If you say, I don't know the answer, I'll go get that. Don't arrive to conclusion or give an opinion. Um, an example I always use, you go in, a backhoe has hit the pipeline, there are three beer cans over there. You say, well, the driver must have been drunk. Look at these beer cans. Don't, don't arrive to those kind of conclusions. Don't make commitments you cannot deliver. That's also very important. Um, and finally, don't say things that you need to apologize for it later. So with that, let me show one quick video and uh, that's, and we're done. And you have to see this. Now, let me say this. Um, he was my boss. He's a very good man, but that was a big mistake because. I'll ask you Sunday. BP CEO apologized. We're sorry for the massive disruption that's caused their lives. And you know, weird. There's no one who wants this thing over more than I do. You know, I want my life back. Life will never be the same. The water and all that lives in and. A so let me just finish by saying this. One of the reasons this happened, and I worked for this man. I got a phone call from a former executive of BP. He said, man, what the hell is going on? Why did he say that? I'll tell you why he said that. He brought his own PR firm from England that was giving him advice. So my advice to you, try 
to either get people that they know the community or people who actually understand the culture and, and where you are operating. Because those two, uh, those two elements is a very important, there are very important elements of crisis communications. Thanks very much.